Um, we, uh, we were just discussing just offline on your airline, your disaster presentation. Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know whether you feel like it, but it'd be lovely to hear a kind of a couple of minutes sort of synopsis of that um, while we're um, warming up. It's, it's strawberries and qu cream and Wimbledon week this week where it's always, um, it's designed to be good weather, but always is terrible. So just, uh, and Wimbledon always lasts twice as long. Um, as well, they're playing the middle Sunday country. this year, aren't they? So that should help. Yeah, they play on the middle Sunday, yeah. So would you like to give us a quick uh, uh, intro? David, hi there, good to see you. Um, Bieri, good to see you too. We're, we're just warming up. So Gina, would you like to give us a quick synopsis of that uh, workshop that you give? Well, it's, it's a new idea that sort of I came up with when Robert uh, posed a question that I actually hadn't thought about. Um, and it's pretty relevant for what's going on in some places these days. Well, sexual harassment is a real thing. It really happens. And I really lived it. And when I reported it to my human resources manager, they did an investigation. And subsequently, two weeks later, I lost my job. And the guy who uh, was the perpetrator, no, nothing happened to him. So what Robert and I kind of came up with is I can use that and a way to... Um, sort of figure out how to, how to not just solve the problem of harassment, but how to prevent it going forward and use my airline experience uh, and, and instructor experience as a crew resource manager, a crew resource manager instructor, um, to how to solve that problem with the theory of using how NTSB solves crash problems, sort of work backwards from the end to get to the beginning and figure out how to prevent these things from happening in the first place. So that's kind of the basic. So that's just something Robert and I came up with and it's brand new. I haven't tested it out yet, but uh, that's sort of the general idea. And uh -huh. I don't know where my webcam is on this thing because I don't. Have, so I'm like, I'm not sure where to look. Am I looking at the camera? Yeah, you're camera? looking. You're looking. Okay, great. good. Because <laughs> I'm used to having my big webcam up, and I didn't set it up this time, so I'm like, I'm not entirely sure where I'm looking. Anybody who puts Union Jacks up, it, it gets extra points. You don't realize. No one realized the actual deal here. Oh, that's normal. That's that. I didn't put those up just for you. That's how that. I just don't oh. have my big background up. I just because I when I went to the UK, I took. Yeah, I, I, you should have just said down, it so. was just for me. It would have been, oh, it is just for you. I, I, you. I got Thank up you. early and hung those specifically. Actually, I should sh hang on. Let me unhook. I'm going to show you something else. Just don't go away. Look at this. You see. There you go. That's <laughs> 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 You just come back from uh, you just come back that's from actually, cheering, cheering on the queen in her diamond jubilee. Big, oh yeah, that's why I was there. But that's a big flag that I use because I have an alter ego um, called Britain Unleashed, and, and it's writing about my you know time and travel spent traveling around the UK. And so when I record Britain Unleashed videos, I put I kind of move everything over and put that great big Union Jack flag up in the background. Beautiful, um, <laughs> Annika. Great to see you. Annika's looking like she's out and about in the fresh air, as well as Stephanie uh, and. Uh, if Stephanie and Sabrina, if you're able to talk, um, I've just actually just had a note from um, our client in Boston, Crystal, maybe Crystal will be able to help us too. Hold on, let's just wait until she comes in. Then we'll get on to Sherry in just a few moments. Um, I can certainly talk. You can talk? Well, Crystal, hi. You can hear me. I want to put Crystal straight on the spot. Can someone help me with Florida stop woke legislation and give us a kind of top line on what it is and why? Um, I just got a note from um, Leah uh, Stowe actually just about um, how do you know how does one incorporate that into kind of virtual workshop strategy? Has anyone got an, a, a top line on explaining context around Florida stop woke? A lot of confused faces out there. Can you say it again? Reason. I'm not sure I understood. It's Florida. So there's some legislation that has been passed in Florida, um, which is anti-DEI education. Um, and Flor it is Flor I, I would just simply say Florida is, you know, anything is game. It's 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 kind of crazy land down there, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but it just, you know. Aisha, hello. Good to see hello, you. everyone. Good to see you. To see <laughs> you, you too. You as well. You as well. So um, all, all I'm saying is uh, just uh, a note for your um, 
for, for further thought and investigation. Uh, we have a, a company that we're working for in Boston who have asked me to figure out a way that we might um, continue to deliver national DEI work whilst um, tiptoeing around Florida stop woke legislation, which is I, pretty peculiar. Has anyone got an idea? Oh, uh, well, I, I actually live in Florida and it's beautiful, beautiful place. But again, a lot of craziness goes on, especially in this DEI space. But, um, and I still have to investigate it further, but uh, my community of, of DEI trainers reached out um, when this legislation was being proposed and they sent it to me. So I have not, I, I confess, I haven't read the whole thing. I kind of skimmed it. Essentially, there are certain things they don't want you to say um, during diversity training, for example, um, some of the things about privilege or they don't want any type of implication that the structural things that are in place that are discriminatory are the fault of people that, you know, that happened a long time ago, why don't you get over it type things. So um, all of my, my DEI community were looking at how our current content coincides or like you say, how can we tiptoe around, not break the law? Um, one of my friends who's a DEI director is looking at, does she need to change some of her unconscious bias training strictly for Florida? But I do have a copy of the legislation. I'd be glad to send it to you and we can brainstorm as to what we can and cannot do moving forward. Thank you very much. It'd be quite something that, um... Diane has talked about how we might circulate this sort of stuff. Gina, by, meanwhile, has got us a link. Um, so that has actually gone into effect today. Um, Sandra, Le Leah, just so, because you joined just a couple of minutes ago, Leah just brought that up, sense that that they're, um, uh, the, that boss, the Boston organization is suspending DEI education in Florida pending um, further understanding of that legislation that went in today. Um, thank how you very much. How big is their much. office Thanks, in Joel. Florida, do you know? Excuse me? How big is their office in Florida? Uh, great question, no idea. Um, Here, I mean, here's my thought is that maybe if, you know, with people traveling now, people could travel to Georgia or some other place for the training, you know, Atlanta or even to the headquarters in Boston where they could get the training, not violate any Florida thing because it's a company training. Thank you. And thanks John for that clarification there in text, which is really useful. So there you go, just, uh, um, a notation that's just in from a client. Um, I'm just going to bring Sherry in in just a few minutes. One of my other pieces of news, which may be news to you, but uh, may not. Um, LinkedIn's algorithm changes over the last uh, two or three months, I think, have been quite onerous. And um, Crystal, shake, Crystal, you've got to come in. I can tell a, you feel the uh, eye rolling. And, uh, you know, um, the work that we're doing, which I think is is valuable, I, I I do feel a sort of sense of powerlessness when it comes to LinkedIn algorithms and how what we're doing um, benefits or does not uh, gains traction or doesn't gain traction and ultimately gains customers. And um, to put it politely, it, it's it's a frustration. Um, when we, Bill and I talk this frankly, he's smiling because I probably used slightly more colourful language when we spoke yeah. about this previously. Crystal, I don't know whether you've got any insight in this, but basically, um, you know, we are getting in your language over the other side of the pond, crickets sometimes when we're putting stuff out there and um, which all, everything that we do, every message that Victoria puts out on our behalf Hi Carmen, every message that uh, we promote, every video that we put out is useful and is, is you know, uh, ought to have tens of thousands of views, hundreds of thousands of likes and so forth. And it's, it's somebody else's choice whether they do or don't. And it is mighty frustrating. So quite, so Crystal, go on, help me out. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not an expert in it, and you're right. It keeps the algorithm keeps changing, but it is still essentially a search engine, right? And so, Victoria, I don't remember from viewing. I usually just read and pay attention to the quote, the amazing quotes. Um, are you using the hashtags? And so, hashtags on LinkedIn can get you a lot more reach. Um, now. When the way I do it for that I've noticed has helped with reach with reach is you can have you can actually look at the amount of followers on the hashtag before you use the hashtag. So I will go in before a post and look at put in the search in the keyword search box hashtag let's say career and I can see if that has many more followers than hashtag career advice. Same thing for a hashtag job hunt versus hashtag job search, right? And then you want to, you don't want to be in the millions. Most people will pick the ones that have millions of followers, but you get lost in that. And so you've got to want to be in the middle ground. This is for all social media. There's, there's like different um, sections or ranges that can help you actually get more reach and not get buried. Um, and also not waste your time on using hashtags that aren't viewed or aren't followed. So that's one thing that um, I can share that might be helpful. I'm not sure. And also, in your, if you're watching the dashboard and the analytics, um, I know on mine, it tells me I've played around with the actual, um, my headline. And I can see when I changed it, there's a drop in the search appearances versus when I change it back then it goes up again. And when I do that, I can look at also, and I don't know, Victoria, if this shows up on your side um, when, it's a, uh, when it's a company, but it'll tell me what are the keywords that I'm being, that I'm being searched, that are being searched for. So I can see where someone will, is searching for career coach versus lawyer versus attorney. Um, and then I can make adjustments in my headline for that as well or am i just being found by other career coaches right things like that so maybe those kinds of things can also help super helpful diane's thank got, you very got, much diane's got another nugget i can tell you're on mute whenever you put something on there tag you know robert tag me tag anybody else so then if you tag it and then we should stay on that message for about 90 seconds to two minutes helps the algorithm you know <clears throat> warm up to us and then i should you know i should comment on roberts i should comment on crystals and so the more we the more we tag each other the more we comment with the at that makes it better and then hashtag that as well so thank you very much um go on crystal John's got something as well. Hang on a second, John. Go, Crystal. Just lastly, I forgot. So the I don't know if this has changed, but if you share something, it's not going to get the same visibility and reach as if you repost, make it an original post. So it's great to share, um, and we want that, and we definitely want the tags, but I have also noticed the difference between I'm putting up a post and I share that post on LinkedIn versus I just create a new post, even with the same content, much more reach again, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because some people overuse that thing and actually sort of repost sort of hourly. John? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things. Be Oops. Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, because uh, LinkedIn is now owned by Microsoft, if you put a link in there that takes you off the LinkedIn platform, uh, they'll slap you over the wrist by not recognizing it in the algorithm. So if you want to put a link to something, put it in the comments, not in your original post. So that's one, one thing that uh, helps the exercise. And we've also got uh, people that are doing post parties where if you get together with a group of 15, 20 people, and then within two hours of the post, people like it, make a comment and share it, that will boost your, uh, boost your algorithm. So they're just a couple of things that, um, that we do that, that have been advised to us by our LinkedIn advisor. Yeah, so um, couldn't be a better segue. I, 
so I, I got an introduction to a bunch of Aussies um, last week um, who run this thing called Built Pod, which is is a, uh, a, a basically a, a sort of consortium. <laughs> I sort of almost see them as a sort of study group because it supports, Crystal, what you're saying, John, what you're saying in terms of hosting. Effectively, you, you come together and say, um, of this group who are ha hashtagging something, if we like it, we're going to like it um, within a certain time frame on a twice per week basis. So we might get a little bit cleverer about this, people, because actually to get that early momentum in, in posts and you, so that we can support your posts, because that's what it's about, and in and also that Victoria's kind of momentum gets amplified. What Philpod do is actually take that to a, to a totally different level, and actually have thousands of people in their group that congregate over an hour or two twice a week in Australian Eastern Standard Time. I think um, East A E S T Sydney. I think isn't it instead of Melbourne? Yeah, Sydney. So there. So so which is sort of which you can pick up in in California in mountain time as well, because it's around about the same sort of time frame. Um, and that helps it kind of push it up. And, you know, totally legitimately, because people basically said, look, we'll collect, we'll gather together like a study group over a period, over a sort of agreed time period. And, and rather than gaming this, if they genuinely like it, and it's genuinely loose, useful, they'll like and post, but they'll make comments not like, hey, that was awesome, but just thoughtful comments. Um, and I'm experimenting with it. I've been invited to join, it's invite only, but I think you know, you'll know you all be invited where you're able to join. Yeah, um, just uh, to Robert though, the comments should be 140 characters like the same as tw the old uh, Twitter and not just, hey, that was great because they look, they look at that and if it's in just in a few characters, they don't recognize it. In fact, they go the other way and say, oh, these guys are collaborating. That, that's right. So, I mean, if it's genuine collaboration, I think it's genuinely applauded, right, John? I don't think there's any reason you could necessarily kind of, yeah, coming to you, Diane, just a sec, just necessarily kind of, you know, crash that because I think that's genuinely exactly what LinkedIn wants is they want that amplification if, so provided it's meaningful. They don't want people to gain, you know, which is fair enough. But also I want some visibility for us. So I'm going to have give, give this some deep thought over the next week or so and come back with some further ideas. But our collaboration, I think, is great on this. Yes, Diane? Um, technically, pods are against LinkedIn's terms and conditions. You will lose your account. You will lose your account. So I know two people who this has happened to. They pleaded, you know, guilty, swore they would never do it again. Um, you need to be really careful with this. So I just encourage everybody, don't get into a pod. I I create I was creating a darling network of people named Darling. I got flagged twice. I ended up screencasting it and sending it to LinkedIn and said, here's what I'm doing. I because they said obviously they're using a bot to catch me. So you know I'm like wait a minute. Here's what I'm doing. I'm looking at darlings and I'm doing invite, 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 invite. I invited everybody to be in my darling network. So just be really careful. If you lose your LinkedIn account, that's like losing a bank. So I shouldn't use, I shouldn't do Clarks because that would be really, that would be. Well, but I big. would just be really careful about signing on to anything at all. I think we just need to do this really organically. Click the little bell on the people whose posts you like comment but i would be really really cautious i mean we are a pod anything. in a way i think more more than a pod much more beautiful than a pod anyway but you're quite right i don't i'm not my I'm, i i take that um health warning I don't think sign up for anything robert please i just really encourage you well, that's just really playing with fire i'm going to investigate this um uh at, sort of separately and carefully in a sort of lab experiment but i totally get i take on i take the, the health warning on board I think the pods are, 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 in a way, maybe that's symptomatic of people's frustrations over LinkedIn, really. Uh, particularly well, but the if problem is that LinkedIn's grown. So when I, what the problem is, is LinkedIn size. I mean, my LinkedIn number is 16,000. I was here when it was the village. Now with 840 million people, it's going to, stuff is going to get lost. That's why quality over quantity. Quality over quantity, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the size of, yeah, it's, 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 you know, a billion plus. So. 
Now I'm coming to, um, I'm going to move on, but uh, we've, we've all taken that on board. Uh, we've covered the, the, the Florida um, stop woke and um, Victoria maybe gather those elements of, of notes on that particular point. And thank you, John, again, for your, in, your, your comments and um, I just put in the chat there, Robert, the Andy Gwynn is a connection of mine and he's an expert in this field. So see, connect with him if you're not already and you can weigh up yourself what he has to say. One last thing, I've taken my frustration out on LinkedIn by going um, old school. And before I come to Sherry, Sherry and I actually discussed this yesterday, um, meaning I've, I've done, I'm actually using LinkedIn, researching um, individuals that have you know, more than a passing connection with you uh, as individuals. So for example, um, in Sherry's uh, context, you know, um, who, who were former college basketball players, for example, Sherry's a former basketball coach, or who were in the US Marines, or who were, uh, you know, who, who have attributes informally that, you know, you can connect with as warm intros. And I've been starting to um, generate uh, actual, I know you guys are going to say this is crazy. Old school emails, one at a time, manually talking to these people as individuals, and you know, get a response. Um, you know, from, from Sherry's perspective, we're talking about you know Sherry's own um, record as a basketball coach, and um, with her college and so forth in context, and. Um, the key thing here is that all of you offer, and I will be brief, but all of you offer knowledge that applies to every single organization in the United States and the UK and everywhere else. Um, business skills, sales, mental health, sustainability, diversity, and, and so forth. And that's because there are humans in that organization. So every single organization will have those issues. The only issue we have is to just crack open that door, just open the door a fraction and then have that dialogue. And that's that's the key. So all of the talk about this organic organic social is 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 critically key and massively frustrating, Diane, as, as you kind of alluded to. Um, but old school messaging one to one, I think, is is useful if we research properly and we respectfully ask the question. In the United States, that's still permissible. Um, in the UK, it's not, um, or in, certainly in the Europe, in Europe, it's it's um, it's frowned upon that you can contact a pe person and talk talk about things that they might potentially find useful. But so we'll stick to the US for the time being. I'll continue to research that and give you a bit more um, thoughts on how um, my investigations have gone and what kind of response rates we've got. Without further ado. I want to introduce Sherry, who's going to give us a quick 20 minute blast of um, Sherry Wynn. And um, I'm, I'm, for those of you who don't know Sherry, she's a double Olympian, she's a basketball coach, and she's a true friend of mine. Um, she's been with Elevate for since the beginning, and she's quite an inspirational human being. And I'm so um, proud and delighted to be able to um, have you on the team, Sherry. It means a lot. Well, thank you, Robert. So I probably, you know, you're all experts, so there's nothing I'm going to give you today that you don't already know. However, as we all know, one of the things we do is we know something, we forget it. Like, so we need to re-remember something or to emphasize it a different way or present it in a different way. Those are the keys to really uh, capturing what we want and to getting the best out of our presentations that we have. So after 3,500 hours of presentations, here's the thing I learned is that people want three things. Number one, they want to be entertained somehow. So that doesn't mean that they have to like fall out of their chair laughing. It just means they have to have some uh, like ha ha's in the, in the presentation. They got to have that moment of just laughter or fun or whatever it is. Number two, they have to be engaged. The worst thing in the world is to present and know that people are on their phones, right? You get a sense of you're in an audience, you stand up on the stage or whatever, and you get a sense that nobody is listening to you. They're too busy doing this. So you have to engage them in certain ways to get them with you. The third thing is they have to be empowered. So when people leave, they have to have some message immediately that they can use. If they can't use it, it's not of interest to them, right? So in every presentation that I give, 
I'm striving for those three things. I really want those three things to occur. And every single event manager I've talked to, the first thing they ask me is, are you gonna engage the audience? I'm like, absolutely, that's gonna happen, right? They want that engagement. So even on webinars, you have to find a way to engage the audience so that people are doing things with you and becoming a part of the experience. I had this great mentor who told me this, look, if you make it about the audience, they're always gonna love you because what they're, what they're judging is themselves. They're not judging you, they're judging themselves. And so I thought, wow, that's really brilliant because the first time I ever spoke on stage, I'll never forget it. There was 2000 people out, you know, I'm up on stage and I knew in five minutes I didn't have them. And I had a 55 minute pre- I had 55 minutes left to go. And I was like, oh, this is painful. And after that experience, I was like, I've got to change. I've got to do things differently because I don't want this experience for me nor for ever an audience again. So what I'm gonna do is actually just go through the first few minutes of how I normally introduce. Now, this is not always, because according to the keynote, it might change, but how I do a keynote and or a, a breakout session or workshop, I usually start with this kind of message and it's A, to get them involved. B, I wanna already empower them with something they can take away right now today that they can use. And C, I wanna start putting the message in about the importance of them uh, investing in themselves because that's a subtle message that you want because you want them to invest in you and see you as the expert and therefore invest in you. So what I'm going to do is just give you an example and walk through the example of something I do with my people that I normally speak to. So I'm going to share my uh, screen with you guys and jump in. Just make sure you can do that. Yep. You got me? Am I there? Yep. Yes. I got to get in slideshow here. Okay, so some of you might know me a little bit. I've been on a lot of different, uh, you can see right there. I don't need to talk about that. Just to know that I've done 3,500 presentations um, and also spoken for people like Anytime Fitness, Edward Jones, Adobe, uh, Hitachi, Dell, those kind of folks. I'm a two-time Olympian national championship basketball coach, three-time Amazon bestseller and author. Let's jump into this. The reason I'm gonna give you practice rules, I'm about to give you three practice rules for life for life so let me ask you first how many of you here and you can just you can virtually raise your hands how many of you in here were a high school athlete just virtually raise your hand let me just check that out anybody high school athlete got like okay we got a couple how many of you were actually uh went on and were college athletes how many of you did that i can you could you can yeah just raise your hand you can i can see you virtually or live great how many of you have ever seen an athlete Come on, how many of you ever seen? Okay, good, we're all connected right there. See how easy that is? We're all connected, yes. So this is not gonna fall to deaf ears. You're gonna understand this from a viewpoint. We are connected. So I'm gonna give you practice rules for life. And the first practice rule is drill for skill, drill for skill. So I want you to, I'll try this in a second. So I wanna, I wanna see you on the screen so I can see you do this. So I want you to put a thumb on one hand and a pointer finger on the other just like that. So let me see you do that, right? Excellent. So Robert, no, no guns in the house, man. Get rid of your pistol. Robert, get rid of your pistol. Take the thumb. Yeah, you gotta be, yeah, just point your finger. Okay, now switch them. And switch them again. Now back and forth as fast as you can without messing up. Everybody try that. Let me try, I got some, I got some people not doing it at all, right? So in the chat room, the chat room, tell me, was it easy? Was it hard? Was it impossible? Am I crazy? Just throw down your experience in the chat room. Oh, he's got, John's like, he's doing something different, right? Uh, so impossible, tricky, very hard, impossible. Diane says, not bad. Like, I got it. Diane, I was watching you and you weren't doing the right thing. So, so, so you're like, yeah, I got it, but you weren't doing what you're, but that's okay. So look, you know this, the first time you try something, it's going to be difficult. That's just the truth of the matter. You have to practice it. As a former basketball coach, I never told my players, look, hey, we're going to go in the gym one time and shoot one free throw, and then I'm going to expect you to be awesome. Well, this is the same truth for life. It doesn't matter what it's in. If it's it's relationships, you you have to practice. If it's in your leadership, you have to practice, right? If you want better health, you have to practice. You have to drill for skill. There's no easy button to getting what you want. You have to drill for skill. So it's a practice rule, right? And we know that in athletics. And yet when we apply it to other things in life, we want it to be simple. And we think we should be able to do it one time and then it goes, boom, got it. That's just not the truth. The reality is anything, anything that you want, anything you desire takes action and repetitive action to get there. So my second thing 
The second practice rule is be coachable, be coachable. So again, I just want to know by raise of hands, right? You can, you can physically raise your hand by raise of hands. How many of you believe that you're coachable, right? That you are coachable. Absolutely. We have to be coachable to get what we want in life. We have to consistently be wanting and driving for that next learning opportunity. Well, I thought, I thought I was coachable. So, you know, after all, I was a two-time Olympian, I'm a two-time model American. You have to be coachable to reach those levels. So the first time that I got a college coaching position as a head coach, I walked into the practice and I was like, oh my gosh, they're horrible. They're horrible. They're absolutely horrible. So I did what most people would do in this situation. I went to complain about it. I walked over to the men's basketball office, knocked on the door, and I said, hey, Coach Ford, <clears throat> I just watched my team, and they're awful. They're absolutely horrible. But I know this, Coach Ford, you cannot make chicken soup out of chicken. Does anybody know that quote? You know the end of that quote? If you know the quote, just put it in the chat for me. Just throw that in the chat room, the end of that quote. I have nobody. No, I got nobody knows in that. You guys don't have chickens where you live? Come on, man, no chicken. I can understand the UK, but come on, we're in the United States, there's gotta be chickens. This, the quote is, you cannot make chicken soup out of chicken poop. My way of saying, look, it's just not my fault. Like, it's not my fault, they're just bad, it's not my fault. And Coach Ford looked at me and says, Coach Wynn, Coach Wynn, are you going to be one of those kind of coaches? <laughs> no, no, of, of course not. Well, Coach Wynn, let me ask you a question, Coach Wynn. Coach Wynn, what do you do with a sick fish? Now, he's referring to a sick fish in a fish tank. So let me ask you guys, what do you do with a sick fish that's in a fish tank? In the chat room, what do you do with that fish? Put it down, please. Kill it. <laughs> kill it. Who said kill it? Oh, my gosh. It's Bill. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> for Fairford's death, we got Bennett, we got Kill It. Oh, there we go, John. John's got it. Clean the tank. Clean the tank, right? So it's terrible. So here's the thing. So I said, I looked at Coach Ford and I go, flush it? He said, Coach Wynn, Coach Wynn, what you do is you clean a tank. I'm like, dude, I ain't, I ain't got no fish. Like, I don't know, what are we talking about here? Coach Wynn, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about you, Coach Wynn. You need to clean your tank. Coach Wynn, when's the last time you read a book on coaching? I'm like, <clears throat> Coach Ford, excuse me, I'm a two-time Olympian. I'm a two-time All-American. I don't need to. Coach Wynn, Coach Wynn, Coach John Wooden said this. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. Clean your tank. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. Clean your tank. So folks, here's the thing, right? So many of us think, so many of us think we're coachable, but the reality is we start saying things like this. Look, I'm 55 years old, I know it. Or we say things like, I've been working this job for 25 years, I've got it. Or I've got a master's degree or a PhD. I know, I know, right? So the moment, the moment that we do that, we've shut off our opportunity for learning because we're living as know-it-alls and not learn-it-alls. So my question to you today is this, how many hours a week do you spend, wait, 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 cancel spend. How many hours a week do you invest? Now, what's the difference, folks, between spending and investing? What's the difference? In the chat room, tell me what's the difference between spending and investing, right? What is the difference? right so robert says for growth right so we're looking the immediate is spend yes crystal versus long term which is return on your investment is what we're looking for so yes bill we want to return on our investment so a lot of people look a lot of people spend their time their energy and their money they spend it right and they don't even know what they got in return but when we invest we're intentionally thinking about what we're doing and what we're gonna get in return for the investment. So my question to you is how many hours a week do you invest in growing you? So in the chat room, how many hours a week, how many hours a week do you invest in growing you? So how many hours a week do you listen to a podcast or 
listen to a seminar or a webinar or you read something that grows you or you have a mentor or a coach somebody who's helping you expand and grow or you do some reflection or some journaling so put that number in the chat room right eek i know this is not robert eek i know this is not enough okay so we've got some good numbers there right we've got some people who are really and i would expect that from this audience i would expect that from this audience so Here's the thing, most of them, I'm a learning fool. Ooh, Gina, you go. Uh, and John says he's got this habit about doing that. Exactly, and that's why you are where you are because you know the difference between spending and investing. You know, a lot of folks don't. A lot of folks spend versus invest. But here's the thing about this, right? We have to be intentional about what we're doing because a lot of people don't get this. So if there is the challenge for us is that if you want something different in your life, you have to change who you are. So you can't get what you want if you still are who you are. You have to change who you are to get what you want, right? So I, I imagine that all of you know this quote. So I'm just gonna ask you to finish this quote for me in the chat room, right? And you know this quote, I'm sure. If you do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, it's called Insanity. See, Crystal's already, and we got people already, ah, da, 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 madness, insanity, right? And yet, how many of us, how many of us do that? And without even realizing it, without recognizing it, what we do is we do the same thing over and over again. We're mad. We're angry about the result that we're getting. And that could be in our relationships. That could be in, you know, our finances, our careers, all those things. And what we have to do is stop and realize, look, being mad at it doesn't change it. So what is it I need to change about me so that I can get alignment with what I want? That's the key. It's not the thing out there that's stopping us. It's the thing in here. We have to stop and look at what do we need to do, right? So uh, Crystal, I love this. Sometimes unless I reflect what, who do I need to be? Ah, love that, love that, love that. Yes, right? So anytime there's a stoppage of things, you have to stop and reflect. What is it I need to change about me? Recently, I was talking to my coach, and this is crazy. So I've had these events pop up. People come to me, and they're like, oh, we'd like to have this event. I actually have a call with them, and then they ghost me. I'm like, what is going on? So I asked my coach, I said, what is happening? I don't understand this. And she said, when did you make the decision that you didn't want the events? I'm like, whoa, dude, that is crazy. Of course I want the events. I want the money. Of course I want that. I like to be in front of people. I like to influence. I like to back. That's crazy. You're crazy. She goes, when did you make the decision? I was like, oh, crap. Okay, let me let me think about this. Well, so what I've been saying, I haven't been saying I didn't want the events, but what I've been saying is I need the time to finish my book. I need time on my calendar to finish my book, right? So I'm asking for, and I'm receiving the very thing that I asked for, and I, had, I didn't realize that because oftentimes what we're doing is we're looking outside as these people are crazy. They don't get it. And it's really investing in our own thought processes, our own recognition, being willing to be coached, right? Being willing to be coached so that we recognize that. So the practice rule number three, I'm going to share with you a final practice rule number three is this. Is to become a yeah and person. Become a yeah and person too many of us live a yeah but life right we live in yeah buts rather than yeah ands so yeah but is yeah but you don't understand my situation yeah but you know recession's coming yeah but it's going to be really hard yeah but we spend our life in yeah buts instead of yeah mm. and what happens when we're living in the yeah but arena is we're we are stifling all creativity and innovation from entering our lives. And, 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 if you're a leader and somebody comes to you, somebody comes to you and you say, yeah, but to that person, you've just stopped them. Bye, Bill. See ya. You just stop them, right? When you say, yeah, but to a person, many people, I'll ask this to my audience and I'll say, you know, if you go to your leader, to your boss, the person you're, you've got this great idea and they will yeah, but you, how many times will you get, how many times would you go back to them? And most people will say one, 
Some people will say never. So think about how we're stifling ourselves and other people about being a yeah, but rather than a yeah, and person, right? So I'm gonna tell you this great story about a guy named uh, Joe Theismann. For some of you who are my age, you might remember him. So Joe played for what was then called the Washington Redskins, now renamed the Washington Commanders. He was NFL Man of the Year. He was a Super Bowl champion. He was amazing. But what you may not know about Joe Theismann is his name is not really Theismann, it's Theismann. He was born with the last name Theismann. And he went to college in Notre Dame. He was up for the, for the Heisman Trophy. His sports information director came to him and says, Joe, what is your last name? And Joe goes, my last name is Theismann. And Bob, the sports information director said, hey, Joe, look, you're up for the Heisman Trophy, Trophy, and we know in marketing that when something rhymes, people pay attention. So what if we change your last name to Theismann so that it rhymes with Heisman? What would you feel about that? And Joe goes, oh no, man, my dad would never, never forgive me. No way can I ever do that. And Bob said, hey, can I call your dad? And Joe goes, good luck, absolutely, good luck. So Bob calls Joe's dad and said, hey, uh, I'm just calling on Joe's behalf. He's up for the uh, Heisman Trophy. And I was just wondering, sir, what's your last name? And Joe's dad said, our last name is Theisman. It's been Theisman for generations and we're proud of this name. And Bob says, well, sir, uh, your son's up for the Heisman Trophy. And because Theisman rhymes with Heisman, we believe he has a better chance of getting that award, which will help him go higher in the NFL draft, which means, sir, he's gonna make a lot more money. And this is what Joe's dad said. Yeah, and Bob, like I've been telling you, our last name is Theismann. It has been Theismann for generations, right? So here's a guy who recognized immediately, he recognized the opportunity in front of him and he went for the yeah and rather than the yeah but. Now, a lot of people wouldn't have done that. They would have been stuck on the yeah buts rather than looking for the possibilities. So I will tell you this, I worked with a company out of Houston called the DHS Group and they brought me in to help them build a winning culture. So what's interesting was they really, really wanted to change their culture because they were a startup company. They hadn't been able to evolve into that place where money's coming in, they haven't gotten the profit zone yet. And they're like, you know, we know our culture is not right to do that, we need some help. So we did five things, I'm gonna share one of them with you right now. So the, one of the, and it was the major impact thing, by the way, was that they eliminated, they eliminated, yeah, but from their company. They eliminated the phrase. So as a unit, they made the decision that they would no longer use yeah, but. So when somebody came to them, they would say, yeah, and explain that more to me. Yeah, and I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, and why don't you go do some research and come back to me with three ways that could possibly work. So they, I, there was a little convincing. Not everybody jumped on board, as you can imagine, right away, because they would say something like this, yeah, but we just don't have time for that. And I would say this, is it ever a loss of time to motivate your team members? No. And they knew that, they, they knew that at some level, but they didn't understand how important it was. So here's what happened. They changed to Yacht Ann, and this is the incredible thing, was just so incredible, is within six months, uh, it's it, within six months, yes, John, I agree with you. Within six months, they were able to uh, get into the profit zone, and within, within one year, they were able to then acquire another company into their company, within one year from making these changes. So you have to imagine, you think, oh, it's just so, so simple. Simple things are often the right solutions. We make things way too complex. And if we can just engage in the simple, then great things will happen. And this company made phenomenal improvements. So my question to you is, you know, what are you willing to change today? What are you willing to do differently as a result of today that will impact your life more positively? What are you willing to do, right? So in the chat room, what are you willing to do differently as a result of our short conversation, as a result of the conversation, of the result of the presentation today? Just one thing in the chat room right now. One thing in the chat room. Yeah. 
learn how to move my fingers better. <laughs> we'll figure out how we can bottle share you win. Thank you, Robert. Right? Was there something said that was different? Learn more, take more action. Yes, go practice my serve toss tomorrow. <laughs> So, so what I'm gonna so that's kind of the end of that like like that first part of my presentation. Um, but what I wanted to show you was really simple. Like, how do you engage the audience, right? So you could see that there was a constant really engagement in throughout the presentation. I'm bringing you back in, even in the webinar. I'm bringing you back in to keep you with me and not separate from me, right? So there was, you know, some kind of chuckles with the Joe Theismann story. That's kind of a funny ha ha story. So there was the entertainment factor. There was the, um, if you listen to me, I was giving you clues about things that you're going to want to do, like pay me. Did you get that? Pay me, right? So very, very subtly, very subtly, you, you were getting some of those, right? So this is the way that you do this is that you create something that starts teaching people, even dropping the idea in early, you know, when I said, are you ready to invest or what's the difference between spending and investing, right? The whole idea of you can't get what you want. If you still are who you are, you have to change who you are to get what you want. Those kind of things are the little starting to give you the information that you need to make a different decision. And then finally end with, ending with a story about the guy, the company that I worked with and how they changed. For, and I didn't say, oh, I was great and I was awesome. But as a result of working with me, this is the result that they got. So I was giving you throughout that little cues to help you realize the importance of investing in me. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to ask questions. I just want to share with you the way that I did it. And if there's, thank you, if there's any way that, if there's any, by the way, if there's any way that I can support any of you, any, any, any of you, if you're looking at how can I, you know, make my presentation better, or if I want to add some humor, or if I want to add more engagement, and uh, I'm happy, I'm happy to gift that to you uh, because you're a member of Elevate. So I'm happy to, to work with you on that. Thank you, Sherry. That was wonderful. This what we don't get is this round of applause that we would have if we were in a room, but you sort of have it virtually delivered. Well done. So um, if you can hear me, yes, you can. I really appreciate it. it it's, isn't it fascinating that those people who do some virtual work and some people who, who, who don't, that you can still get goosebumps, you know, 7,000 miles away. And still be inspired and still um, really feel it that, um, you know, you're being taken through something which is transformational. And I think, I think if we can, I, I meant it about bottling Sherry Wynn, and it's really kind of you to uh, offer those services, Sherry. Sure. It's, well, I want to answer, please. I want to answer Stephanie's question because I, I, I didn't do a call for action at the end. So um, what I did do was plant the seeds to get to the call to action. So planting the seeds were things like, you know, do you invest or do you spend? That's planting a seed. Planting a seed is, you know, if you do the same thing over and over again, you get insanity. Planting a seed, you know, so all those and drill for skill, planting a seed, like you gotta, you gotta practice, right? And so all those are planting seeds. At the end of it, there would have been a call for action. So whatever your call for action is, uh, is, you know, that you use toward the end of your, your your presentation which that was just a piece of it but you have to have a call <clears> for action because you have to because people aren't just going to go oh okay you have to say what you want them to do at the end so normally what i would do uh, most of the time what i'm looking for is and i will drop hints throughout my presentation about the number of people i spoke to at this event or you know how how this event can be had me back five times i will drop something like that in the presentation as well <clears throat> but then you have to have an obvious call for action. So what do you want them to do? So many times what I'll say to them is this, hey, uh, folks, if, if you're ready to change, like if you're ready to invest in yourself, if you're ready, if you don't like what you're getting, like if you, keep, if you don't like the results of your health or your wealth or whatever, if you don't like that, here's what I'm going to offer you for free. And then I'll go, wait, 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 it's not free. Because people always go, when you say free, they go, uh, what's the catch? So tell them what the catch is. 
I'm gonna offer you for free. I'd go, wait, it's not for free. Here's the catch. In return, I'm gonna give you a free coaching call. In return, in return, you're gonna rant and rave about me to other audiences and associations and folks. So if you will guarantee that you'll do that, then I'm gonna offer you a free coaching call. Of course, now in the free coaching call, what I'm doing again is I'm dropping in all kinds of hints and ways for them to hire me to be their coach. Because, but I have a phone call with them now, which is much different, folks, than if you don't have that call. Brilliant. Diane, do you have anything to add to some, before I sum up? Sherry, do you get any pushback on um, selling from the stage with that? Because that is selling from the stage. It doesn't sound like selling. It doesn't sound like selling. That's the difference. When you know people are selling, their pitch is like forever and ever and ever and ever. It doesn't sound like selling, you're just sharing stories. And that's the difference. Well, I think um, there, are, there are a number of takeaways from here and I think it'd be really worth us kind of looking back. I'm gonna give you a quick, a few little, uh, um, pointers and, and thoughts. Um, these sessions uh, weekly, we're going to try and bring in, if, if you've got the chance and the opportunity to deliver one of these 20-minute um, sessions one once a year to us, it's a great time for you to sort of flex your muscles and uh, in terms of your own presentation capabilities, but also give us these nuggets, which, you know, on Sherry's side, we're sort of Obviously, there are two levels of delivery and content, which I think were, was really tremendous. Um, Victoria's taking names and we're taking, we're putting diary dates all the way through the rest of 2022. And so I really appreciate you guys if you want to step up, even if you haven't done 2,700 presentations that you qualify as part of our tribe. And I, and, and I really do think it would be uh, tremendous to give it a go. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it, that once you have the taste of a virtual talk, not me, because I'm the guy behind the curtain, of somebody who's good, like Sherry Wynn, then all of a sudden you feel that provided you could just get in front of any organization that has a budget, say over 500 staff in the United States or North America, you know that by doing that, those processes of your content and this kind of nurturing and seeding and in investing and paying and training, as Sherry said to me, you know you're going to get them over the line. The fascinating thing to me is that is that if we combine that those skills with that door opening, we're there. Um, Gina made a, a, a great point just now about. Um, you know, investing is sort of part of our, our, our team in, in this contact. And that again is part of this process. There's that content provided you can just crack that door open. Wasn't it Gina, what you mentioned, remind me what you just mentioned, cause I can't find it on the chat where you talked about, um, Oh, uh, like, I said uh, using the, um, alumni associations, you know, yeah, so go through your, we've got huge, I've got a huge alumni association and I have yet to contact any of the members who own businesses. And there are a lot of them. So all of us yeah, have this so amazing any, any network. You guys who are in the U S alumni associations, go tigers, go horns, go redskin, whatever it is, Wolfpack. you guys say, um, college sports in the United Kingdom is slightly different. We have sort of a man and his dog on the sideline. We don't have stadiums or anything like that. We're very primitive, but for you guys, all, all of those things, all of those alumni associations, the chess club, the this, the that, the other, you'll be super surprised how much amplification that is over the years in terms of that warm introduction. And I'd love to hear from you in terms of how I can help. Um, you know, that's what we're here for as part of my part, my, my part of this bargain. How can we reach out um, on your behalf with you to be able to open the door? And as soon as you do open the door, um, to work on some of those uh, techniques that Sherry's just been talking about, I think is really amazing. It's so stifling, the yeah, but isn't it? It just keeps kind of coming back to me. It's so, I mean, in corporate worlds of thousands of staff that I've been involved in, in previously in my life, it's almost all you get. There's just this kind of no culture. It's extraordinary, absolutely amazing. 
Anybody have anything to add before we wrap up at four minutes to the hour? John's leaning forward. No, I've just I've got another session coming up in three minutes. So I'm <laughs> it's okay. just saying to everybody, it's been lovely to catch up with you all. I left a little tease in the chat for you all. That's great. And I'd I'd appreciate you, John and um, Ayesha, Sandra, Sabrina, Deborah, anybody, um, Crystal, that um, Diane, if you'd like to step forward and give us 20 minutes, a blast of your skills. It's absolutely tremendous for everyone to really start investing in themselves, selling business skills, NFTs, um, mental health, uh, where, wherever you want to go, it, it's most welcome. And I think it'd be really illuminating for everybody. So, phew, I've got a lot to digest after that. Sherry, thanks so much for your time today. And thank Sherry, you. Sherry, thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank, thank you, you so Sherry. much. Very good. You guys take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.